Greg Dickerson is here, and uh, Greg has been my personal mentor for a couple of years now. A uh, little history on Greg. I'll let him go into more details, but just how I came to find um, Greg was I was looking for mentorship in the development space, and I looked online, and sure enough, there was an online course uh, on real estate development. So it wasn't uh, that costly. Uh, my wife and I were in Florida at the time, and it was something I was able to download and watch on the plane ride back. Um, and as soon as I, I think it was before we landed, I looked at my wife and I said, I need to figure out how to work with Greg one on one. And sure enough, when we landed, uh, I found out that Greg does uh, mentorship and I signed up and we've been working together ever since. So Greg's developed uh, 250 million on uh, of his own developments. Uh, and there was a tremendous amount in terms of what we do on a daily basis in the dental field and our exits for all different types of uh, physicians and dentists and optometrists. Um, and he's helped many of his students. So the gentleman who wrote the best book on apartment syndication was one of Greg's students. Uh, Vikram from Viking Capital is one of Greg's students. So if you've heard any of these names, these are kind of guys who reach out to the dental group as well. Um, and all of Greg's students together, I think, are getting to the point where it's about three billion that's been developed or purchased or flipped. So a great person to have, um, very down to earth guy, and just helps in any way he can. Yeah, well, you know, thank you guys for having me. And, um, you know, I'm assuming everybody on here are dental professionals, maybe some medical professionals in there as well. And uh, just put in the chat real quick, if you are a dental professional, medical professional, just put yes. I want to see how many people on here are. And the reason I'm saying that, I work with a lot of medical and dental professionals all over the country, around the world. Uh, I've got people outside the United States that I'm coaching in real estate development and building. I've got people in the United Arab Emirates. I have people in uh, Canada, people in um, one guy in um, New Zealand. So, uh, you know, the fundamentals are same all around the country. So yeah, pretty much everybody's saying yes. Yeah. So here's the thing. So number one, I started with nothing. I didn't go to college. I went in the Navy right out of high school, started with absolutely nothing. I learned it all the hard way. You started out swinging a hammer as a little remodeling handyman contractor. Um, my first year I did 250,000 in, in revenues. I built that into a $30 million company, sold it, uh, you know, in seven years, started 12 other companies along the way uh, while I did that and reinvested all the profits into real estate along the way. And the way I learned was, number one, um, educating myself. So I didn't go to college, but I'm very self-educated. So, you know, I constantly pour into myself, even to this day. So I never had any music on my, you know, back in the day, it was, uh, you know, eight track uh, tapes and then, you know, Sony Walkmans and then the CD players, disc players, and then the, you know, 80 gig iPod. I still have my 80 gig iPod loaded with, you know, all kinds of personal and professional development stuff. So anyways, that was me. I was always just pouring into myself, learning everything I could. But the biggest thing was I took action. And what happens with a lot of people, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people just starting out. And if you are, just say, hey, I'm just getting started out so we can kind of see who's beginners here and haven't really done anything. Uh, you know, the key is, and for those of you that, that have portfolios and they're already in the game, you know, the key is to just get started. So for me, my first, other than buying my first, you know, couple of houses that I lived in, uh, my first deal was a lot flip. Uh, a friend of mine who was a realtor brought this lot to me and he said, hey, you put up the money. Um, I'll take care of all the uh, you know contracts and everything. We can buy it. My dad has a client that'll buy it from us, and we can flip it. We'll make you know thirty thousand dollars. So I put up a hundred grand. He did everything else, and we split thirty thousand. And I thought you know I thought that was just lighting the world on fire. So remember, this was back at the time when I was only doing probably maybe a million a year in business at the time. You know, keeping twenty percent of that. So I was only making a couple hundred grand a year. Um, so to me, that was a, that was a big deal, and we did it in thirty days. So, you know, the light bulb started going off. So I just went on a tear and started just tying up land. So anytime I made money in my company, you know, instead of you know, buying a car, or, you know, doing a bunch of crazy stuff, I would take it and I would tie up land and, you know, uh, get some land positions. And then I would turn around and flip those uh, lots to investors and then build them investment properties, you know, short-term rental properties uh, down on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. These were multi-million dollar, you know, beach houses that I was building. And I'd never done anything like that up to that point. You know, so, um, you know, what I did was I surrounded myself with people that were, you know, better and smarter than me that, you know, were building the types of homes I wanted to build that were doing the types of developments I wanted to do. People were coming down that were cashing out of the stock market and, you know, making money in their companies. They were coming to the beach and buying properties and building houses. So I was selling them land and building houses for them. So I kind of learned from them along the way. So, you know, 
all of you guys on here, you know, are way ahead of the ball, you know, the game compared to where I was when I started out, you know, back in 1997, when I started this entrepreneurial journey of mine, because uh, I had nothing. I didn't have any credit. I couldn't borrow any money. I sat down with bank after bank after bank. They wouldn't lend me a dime. Um, I had to use credit cards and I had to use um, cash flow from jobs to finance and fund and grow and scale my business and, you know, to do all the real estate deals that I was doing. So that quarter of a billion was just me, my own money, using my own bank loans. Uh, all of the, you know, businesses that I started, uh, started just me as the investor doing equity capital. And, you know, I've done hundreds of millions of deals with other investors as well, but that was my own personal, you know, deals and holdings that I did. So, you know, that that's really it. And, you know, I've got clients all around the world. One of them shared the other day in our mastermind group that they started with one house back in 2011. And now they're at, um, what is this? Okay. Now they're at uh, 250 million in assets under management. They've got thousands of doors. They self-manage all their properties. They don't sell anything. And they've got a mixture of single families. Uh, they're getting into bigger multifamily. And they're also doing uh, townhouse uh, build for rent developments. You know, I think they have a $25 million development going similar to, you know, what Simon's doing. So, you know, the world is your oyster. And all, all you have to do is just start with one, start somewhere and then build from there. And, you know, if you want to grow and scale and build a billion dollar portfolio, that's great. If you want to have 10 or 20 properties and just pay them off, that's great. So there are no rules. You know, there are, there's nothing that you can't do that you have to do uh, or anything like that. So, you know, that's, that's my story in a nutshell. And, you know, hopefully that triggered some things and inspired some things. So, you know, go ahead and anybody has a question. Um, you know, I'm here to just answer questions and just kind of help you guys any way I can. Pete, I see you uh, on with your wife. Um, I know you've texted me a few times the last few weeks. Let's hear what you got. And I know Pete from, uh, from dental school. He's actually in my wife's class, so one year uh, behind me. And then uh, by the time I decide to get my things together and go into residency, I think you're already teaching at Harvard, right? Yeah, so double, double connections between the two of yeah. us. There you so go. If you guys have questions, go ahead and pop them in the chat. I'll try to keep up with it. <laughs> Um, my wife actually has a, a question for you that she was thinking to ask. So, sure. Hi, I'm Matilda. Uh, not a dentist. I'm an attorney. Um, <laughs> but a question about you know when you're investing in a, a potentially large development, Simon, you were talking about you know over 150 units. How do you mitigate risk in an investment like that, particularly in a volatile market, or if you're working with um, you know, a variety of different contractors where a variety of different things can go wrong. What do you do to sort of protect your investment or do you just accept the risk? Yeah, so real estate development, you know, like anything has risk. So number one, you need to understand the risk. You need to accurately calculate that risk and you need to be able to withstand the hit if and when that risk happens. The biggest mistake investors make is they don't accurately calculate the risk and they're usually not able to withstand the hit when it happens. So I went through 2008 and nine, I had about 40 million uh, in construction loans out at the time. And I had permanent mortgage commitments on the back end. And uh, I built all these things and, you know, some commercial, some residential. And when they finished, I tried to move into uh, permanent uh, financing on those. The banks were collapsing and they wouldn't do the loans. So, I mean, how do you calculate that? Right. You know, I had a hundred thousand dollars a month going out on interest payments, you know, but I had cash flow and everything. So I had to work all those out, but you know, when you're doing development projects, number one, no matter what you're doing, you have to, you have to be the expert, right? So you need to know a, a little something about what you're doing. And then you surround yourself with a team who is obviously better and smarter than you that has been doing what it is that you want to do for years and years and years. So the last thing you want to do is get into a development project like that with architects, engineers, you know, consultants, you know, environmental utilities, you know, all the different consultants you need that either don't have the experience, don't have a track record or haven't done what you're doing. So whatever it is you're doing, find the appropriate professional that that's what they do. Just like in the legal profession, you have specialties. So in, in the development business, you know, if you want to do million dollar homes, you don't hire the guy that's building $200,000 homes. You know, you get the guy that does a million dollar homes and vice versa, because the guy that's doing million dollar homes, he can do $200,000 homes, but they ain't going to cost 200,000. You know, yeah. They're going to cost 250. So you want to make sure if you're going to build, you know, multifamily, uh, you know, buildings, you know, you want to get somebody that that's what they do. They're experts and, and they've been doing it. Um, you know, the only other and then you build in, you know, risk controls. So you want to make sure that you always 
you know, the biggest thing is it always takes longer. It always costs more. And a lot of times you make less. So you got to be okay with that. And you need to understand that that's part of the process. So you want to have deep pockets. It doesn't have to be yours, but somebody in your team has to have deep pockets so that you can uh, handle those risks or those hits when they happen. And things are going to happen. But for the most part, you know, as you go along, if you have the right team, you can mitigate a lot of that, uh, especially with good planning up front, good consultants, a good set of plans, and make sure that you've got, you know, good building information systems on the front end so that you're, you know, as organized as possible going into it and eliminate those mistakes. But right now you've got interest rate creep, you've got cost creep, and you've got time that adds to the cost of the project. So those are the big things. So you just need to say, well, if I think it's going to take 20 million, I need to have an extra million or two and be ready and prepared to invest that if that's what happens. Uh, so uh, hopefully that answers the question. I think that was a great answer. But um, yeah. one other thing that you taught me along the way was uh, several uh, points of exit along the path. So um, the land deal needed to make sense when Greg and I were going through our first deal. So you're not going to make it up further down the line. So if the land doesn't make sense, uh, you think you're going to make it up in construction, that's not going to happen. So we looked at the land, the land made sense. So we moved to the next step. And that was we develop the land and uh, subdivide and get all the entitlements in place and sell that and exit and have a profit. And I had some on that first development that Greg and I worked on, we actually had some offers um, at that point to exit or you go to the next stage, uh, you just do all the site work, do all your uh, horizontal construction um, and exit at that point. And we knew what what the value was uh, and the next point would be go uh, to do the vertical. So not only do you wanna make sure that all your costs are, I, I know on, on mine, whenever I'm underwriting something, I try to be as conservative as possible. If it's gonna cost uh, 180 square foot from what my contractors tell me, um, on my underwriting, I can put in $200 a square foot. So I'm always overestimating my costs and always underestimating what I think my rents are gonna be. Yeah, thank you for that. So multiple exit strategies. So our exit strategies were, we could flip the, the land with just you know basic entitlements, no improvements. You could flip the land improved and sell pads or pieces or parcels. You could build and sell units. You could build and rent, sell, you know, sell a piece here or there, build a little bit, rent a little bit. So there were multiple exit strategies, but the number one thing in land development, real estate developer 101, you never close on the land until you get all of your permits, all of your entitlements, your, improver, your approvals and your permits, no matter what, never close on the land until you get it all because you just never know what could happen. I'm working with, you know, one of our clients is a, a played for the New York Giants, played in the Super Bowl, and uh, I'm helping him uh, build his development company. And he had a piece of land that he owned and his family that were doing a 54 unit multifamily ground up, his first project. And uh, in the city of Wildwood in Florida, where this is, that's the villages in Florida, um, there was a moratorium that they uh, instituted for new development because they don't have enough water and sewer to service the new growth. He didn't know about it. We didn't know about it. Our engineers didn't know about it. And, uh, you know, that we found out about it right as we were going to submit permits. Well, we were fortunate. Well, number one, he owned the land. So it was in the family. So that they had no debt. But um, the fortunate thing was the way they did it there was we had already started the uh, process of rezoning the property and um, you know, getting it approved for what we wanted to do, annexation and, re and rezoning. So that triggered the start of the, of the process, put it in the pipeline so that we you know, got ahead of the moratorium where other jurisdictions would be, if you don't have a permit, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna put a moratorium on uh, those types of things. So you know, those, those are some of the ways that you can really mitigate that. And you know, the thing about real estate development is you're a master craftsman. So as a real estate developer, I'm an expert at all of the different assets, all of the different types of construction, all the different types of, you know, whether it's value add, whether it's ground up, whether it's adaptive reuse, whether it's, you know, opportunistic, whether it's, you know, just core, core plus, you know, that's what's really cool about being a real estate developer. You know, you become a master craftsman at all of it. So you can really do anything. So you can be nimble. Uh, you know, so those are some of the best ways. We've got some questions hey, coming in. Hey, hey Greg. Uh, we yeah. got Paul who rose, rose his hand. I think he wants to come on and ask a question. And then we have some in chat as well. Okay. Hello. You guys yeah, hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, guys. What's up? It's good to see uh, Simon and Greg, Josh, some hey, other people from the group. Good to see y'all. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I guess one of my questions is, um, you know, some of y'all know I've been doing like uh, single family homes and and, um, you know, when I look at a single family home listing or something like a potential deal, 
I know what my buy box is. I know how to kind of just instantly, you know, it sets, it goes through a list of criteria that I need um, for it to fit in my buy box, right? So when you see a piece of land, so I'm, you know, with development, I'm completely new to it. So when you see a piece of land for sale or you drive by some sign that says this land is for sale, like some raw land, what is like your, what do you go through first in your head before, you know, like, what, what do you, what is your quote unquote, I don't know if a buy box works in development, but what is that, you know, list of things you go through in your head to determine if it's worth looking into um, or if it's, yeah. you know, time. -wise. So generally most developers are going to have a preferred type of asset that they want to develop, whether it's multifamily, commercial, self-storage, you know, medical office, you know, whatever it is. So generally you're going to have a buy box if it's that, and there's going to be certain parcels that are going to be suitable for that. Uh, but if you're just looking for whatever, it starts with, you know, highest and best use and what's allowed. So, you know, you got to look at the zoning uh, on the property. What, you know, what are the allowable uses? Do you need to get it rezoned? Uh, is there any annexation required? Do you have to get conditional use permits, special use permits, those types of things. And then you always want to think about highest and best use. You know, what's missing? What are the demand, demand drivers? You know, what, what is that property going to be best suited for? Because not every use is right for every property and not every property is right for every use. So those are the types of things that you need to think about. And the way that you know those things is you talk to, you know, you know, number one, just searching, obviously on Google, you can kind of see what's around there and, you know, kind of what's missing, you know, does it need a medical or dental office? Does it need a strip center with, you know, the Starbucks and Chipotle and the hair cuttery and those types of things? Does it need self-storage? Does it, you know, would a hotel work? So some types of uses are going to be more retail driven where others are going to be more destination driven. You know, is it industrial? Is it residential? What's it surrounded by? Is it foot traffic, street traffic, demographics? You know, all of those things come into play. So right. generally, you know, start with what you want to do first. But, you know, that's when I'm looking at a piece of land, uh, you know, those are the basic things. And then you start looking at, you know, topography, you know, what type of uh, utilities access is there? What does the traffic look like? Uh, you know, is there any intersection improvements that need to be done? You know, visibility, if you want to do a retail type of thing. Uh, so those are just, you know, some of the high level basic things that you're going to want to take a look at when you're doing that. Now, if, you, if you're going to do like a hotel and it's 132 keys, well, you know, well, I'm going to need at least, a, you know, a couple of acres, probably I'm going to need, you know, demand drivers. It's going to need to be in these areas that people are going to want to come stay at a hotel. You know, yeah. if it's going to be a retail strip center, then there's going to be traffic counts, demographics. If you're doing a build to suit for a triple net, like a Walgreens or a CVS or something like that, you know, they've got criteria that you can find on their websites they'll tell you what they look for, Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, you know, all of that. That's a really good way to learn is go to their websites, uh, look up their real estate department and see what their uh, criteria is. And that'll kind of give you an idea of what they look for in terms of, uh, you know, demographic and, you know, uh, criteria, size of land, you know, things like that. Okay. Yeah, because sometimes I'll, I'll I'll drive by, like, I, I know I asked you about this. It was a... Uh this random plot of land in Tyson's and it was for sale. And I was like, there's so many buildings around this plot of land and no one's touching this plot of land. I was, there must be some sort of red flag. There must be a reason why no one's building on it. And so I was, it was just kind of tickling my brain a little bit. Yeah. A lot of times that's, that's price, you know, that yeah. they just have a huge number on it and just doesn't work. And, you know, those are postage stamp lots there that you have to go vertical and that's very expensive construction and very difficult to do and takes a certain type of investor and, you know, that Tyson's Corner area, you know, office space is abundant, you know, uh, residential is not appropriate for every site. So, you know, that's yeah. probably what's going on there. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks. So here's a question, Charles Key. Um, in today's market and interest rates, what's the best place to start? So, um, you know, like I said, you know, the key is to just get started, you know, pick you know, well, number one, you can pay anything you want. It needs to, depending on your goal, it needs to work. So you're going to reverse engineer that, um, you know, back into your goal. So if you're going to, you know, keep it and rent it, then, uh, you know, it has to cash flow. So you just work the numbers backwards. If you're going to build it and sell it, you got to make a profit. So you need to figure out if I got to invest half a million dollars, you know, um, it's going to cost me X to build it. I don't want to make, you know, hundred thousand dollars. The interest cost is going to be X, you know, construction costs are going to be X all that kind of stuff. So you basically reverse engineer the goal and just back into what you want to do. Um, as far as profitability goes, you know, across the board, short-term short rentals are probably the most profitable in the right locations right now, but that's not super scalable, you know, because it's one unit at a time. Um, you know, commercial, 
medical, dental, those types of office buildings are pretty profitable. Um, you know, multifamily, depending on what you get, where you get, you know, those are difficult to make work right now because of the prices. Uh, so it really, really is up to you uh, what you want to do there, but you can pay whatever you want as long as the deal works. So that's really the key, reverse engineer it. Hey, Greg, can I just add one little thing that goes on what you're saying with Paul is a lesson I learned is, you know, if, if a piece of land has been on the market for a while, there's usually a reason and it might not be so obvious until you talk to the plan, uh, planning board and your civil engineer. It might be just a little sliver of land that is a right of way or some utility or something, you know, just because you can you can go to a piece of land and be like, wow, this is this is great, so much opportunity here. But then you you uncover these little things and say, okay, that's why this has been on the the market for so long at this price. Yeah, land's very nuanced, and yeah, it could be all kinds of things. Could have easements, could have you know restrictions. The other big mistake people make too is they'll say, uh, uh, you know, this land is zoned for twenty units an acre, so it's ten acres, so I can do two hundred units. Well. That's not always, that doesn't always work because you're going to have lot coverage requirements. You're going to have parking, storm water. Uh, you're going to have gross floor area ratios you have to meet. So just because it's zoned for one thing doesn't mean that you're going to actually get it. Uh, you know, and that's generally a rule of thumb, 18 to 20 units an acre for most multifamily. Sometimes you can get up higher than that if you go vertical, but general garden style. Commercial, you can generally do about 10,000 square feet an acre plus or minus, but that varies greatly. So there's little rules of thumb that you can kind of tap into. But yeah, I mean, you know, if there's a if there's a good property in a great location and nobody snatched it up, there's going to be a reason, <laughs> you know, something. Most of the time it's price. A lot of times it could be, you know, zoning or just, you know, any number of things. Um, here's one here it says um, that we mentioned earlier about prefab bu buildings. How do you get those to cash flow? My math always puts them cash flow negative. Well, you know, again, uh, I don't I don't know what that is you're talking about, whether it's residential, multifamily or whatever, but prefab isn't always the cheapest route, but it can be quicker. Um, I think I answered a Facebook post on that the other day. The problem with prefab is you generally have to put a lot of money up front, sometimes pay for the whole thing before you receive the unit. Um, and so you want to make sure you've got a good manufacturer that, you know, has a solid track record. I had a friend of mine that was doing several hotels back before the pandemic started. And he was doing modular and the modular manufacturer went out of business and he'd paid him, you know, for half of all three of his buildings. So he lost, I don't know, 30, $40 million just gone that he gave in deposits on these buildings. It might've been more, it might've been closer to 50. Um, so you want to make sure you've got a good company. And then you want to make sure you've got a good general contractor that does modular because the modular company is going to set the building on your foundation, on your site. So you still got to do site work, utilities, foundation and all that. And that stuff has to be dialed in and tight. So, you know, um, you just want to make sure that whatever it is, whether it's ha a house, whether it's, you know, a building or, you know, a big multifamily project, you've got a really good manufacturer and a really good team uh, to be able to execute on that. But again, just reverse engineer it. And, you know, it's, numbers are what they are. And, and, you know, they're difficult to make work right now with interest rates jumping up as quick as they have because, you know, sellers and property owners haven't adjusted to to the valuations that we need as investors and developers to make projects work. Hey, Greg, just one quick thing before you jump jump in. We got some great stuff in chat, but um, I just want to plug our Facebook group, Dental Developer, because I see like Lori's thing in chat um, and another chat from someone in DC. Um, <clears throat> even if you're not looking to be a developer, you just kind of want to understand it. I, I think our Facebook group is just, it's, it's, it's awesome for that. So I just recommend go to Facebook and check out uh, dental developer and it should, it should pop right up. But I just want to let everyone know to join that. Yeah. So depending on the market where, uh, will there be multifamily apartments oversupply? I read somewhere on bigger pockets that in hot markets like Austin, that rents may decrease and vacancies will be higher in the coming two to three years. What would be the best way to mitigate risk if market conditions to work uh, conditions worsen. So let me give you one thing on bigger pockets. Be careful on bigger pockets. There's a lot of people on there that have never done a deal and they'll Google a question and they'll go just put an answer in um, or they'll now use chat GPT. So, you know, be careful who you're engaging with on bigger pockets. Um, you know, there's some really credible people that are on there that um, when you go look at, uh, you know, ratings of all time ratings, you'll see who some of the, you know, top people are there especially in the multifamily sector, but, uh, you know, real estate's hyper-local. So every market's different. You know, right now, Austin's one of the markets that's correcting, 
but not everywhere in Austin. So every every state, city, neighborhood, you know, street and position on that street. I mean, that's how hyper local real estate is. So you could be getting two thousand dollars a month rent here, one street over, it's fifteen hundred. So you really need to know your market. Really need to know what's going on there. Uh, Arizona is another one, uh, Phoenix, and we've you know I've got a client out there. And, um, you know, he said the same thing. He said, you know, there's areas in Phoenix where and in Las Vegas where rents are just, you know, nosediving. He said there's other areas where you have a waiting list and you can charge whatever you want. So, you know, you just really need to understand the nuances in the market. Uh, as far as housing goes, you know, your big areas are Florida, you know, Texas, you know, Arizona, Vegas. You know, that's where a lot of people during the pandemic just left the big cities and started going there. So they had a big influx, some Midwestern states as well. I think Idaho is one of them. So um, some of those states like, you know, Arizona, for some reason, Austin, Texas, you know, housing prices are contracting, uh, uh, you know, severely, but they were at distorted levels anyway. So they're still higher than, than they should be from a normal appreciation rate of, of housing, uh, even though rents are backing up in some markets. Again, rents were at very distorted levels. So they're starting to back up a little bit in some areas. And where you're seeing a lot of distress, too, is in the cities with a lot of the tech companies that are, you know, eliminating office space and requirement for back to work. Um, you know, there's a lot of office space that's vacant. So those people are moving and have moved. So the, you know, rents are, you know, under pressure in those areas a little bit to the downside. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, it really depends on, on the areas, but nobody knows what's going to happen the next two to three years. There's a lot of multifamily development in the pipeline, but the markets we're in in Florida, there's, there's, you know, very low vacancy, vacancy rates and, waiting list for especially new product out there. So you just got to be real careful, understand the market, understand the you know dynamics. And what you're looking for is positive net migration. You want more people moving in uh, that are moving than are moving out. And those are the areas you want to be in. You want to be where there's you know very high vacancy or very low vacancy rates where you know um, you've got good assets where you know that you can sustain your rents. But you know, if we get into a bad situation uh, and you know people are going to have to move, then you know rents will come under pressure. But Typically, your nicer product, you, you don't have those problems. You know, class A, you know, B, B plus. Just, just to add to that, uh, we're in New England, but uh, most everything that Mona and I own is in New Hampshire. And it was actually on the news this morning. I sent it to Pete. Um, I think it was even before eight o'clock. I woke him up with that text. Maybe not woke him up, but um, the news story was uh, right. Uh, Nashua, for example, or the entire state is actually 0.05% uh, vacancy, and Nashua is one of those towns. So there's an uh, Invest NH program, uh, which is where we, we received a $3 million grant last year for phase three of one of my projects, but they just released another $100 million uh, in grants for multifamily housing. Um, the news story said they're 30,000 units short uh, as it stands right now, but they do not expect in 10 years to be anywhere near where they need to be because all the builders are pulling back. So they think in about 10 years, the number is going to get much worse. It's going to be 60,000 units short of where it needs to be. So maybe as a group, we can, we can make up some of that deficit. Um, in right. our London Dairy project, we have about 350 people. Uh, it is a workforce housing project, which is not Section 8 or anything like that. It's just if you make 80% or less than the income in that town, uh, you get a discount on your uh, on your rent, so that's how we were able to get some of those tax credits and uh, get some of those some of that grant money. And that's what this Invest NH program is about. But because of that, we have a brand new building with uh, a bunch of units, and people want to get in there because um, units are, the rates are reduced compared to what you could find in the area, and there's nothing available anyways. So we're we're placing people who've uh, been on the list since since we got our CO. Um, so it is it's very market specific like like greg mentioned yeah it is but you know nationwide we're underbuilt for housing so right now the nahb and uh, national association of realtors has come out that you know we we couldn't build our way out of the demand in five years if we could build as many units as we need to build so the construction industry there's no help you know builders can't build enough units fast enough because there's such a you know labor shortage uh multifamily same thing there's so much demand because there's no houses so people need to rent and, you know, households are growing, but there's no inventory in most areas. You know, some areas you can't give houses away. Other areas, you know, they're still getting multiple offers. Prices are going back up again. Uh, so it's it's really interesting times. Definitely. Here's one. How long are you keeping a piece of land under contract? If you're going through the entitlement process, isn't that sometimes 18 months plus? Yes. So every, every area is different. That project we're working on in Florida, he owned the land. 
we started two years ago with the, uh, with the annexation um, rezoning process, and we are now uh, about two weeks away from building permits. So yeah, it's as long as it takes. And um, you know, I've got sample contracts. Simon's got a sample contract that I helped him with uh, on his. And what you do is you put the uh, property under contract. You have an initial 90 to 120 day feasibility period. That's where you decide, you know, is what I want to do feasible? Is it going to work? You you know, you vet kind of the you know low hanging stuff that you can vet in terms of utilities and things like that to see if you can somewhat build what you want to build. And then once you uh, think that you can move forward, then you go into your due diligence period, which is, you know, verifying conditions, getting all your permits and your entitlements and approvals. You give yourself at least a year, depending on the jurisdiction, could take longer, could be quicker, but at least a year in most areas. Some areas it could be two years and you don't close till you get it. And I've got a very specific clause in the contract that, uh, you know, details, you know, the time frame and how that works and that you get extensions and you have to keep this, you know, the seller updated on your progress and you have to be making substantial progress. So you can't just tie it up and do nothing. So you have to prove that you're doing the work, that you're on the time frame that you said you were going to be on and, uh, you know, in order to get it closed. And if you don't, then, you know, they can kick you out of the deal and you give them all your work product. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how that goes. So uh, the first project that Greg and I worked on together, uh, the previous developer, took him he was working on it for about eight years and there was a historic cabin on the site that he wasn't able to get approved to have removed and it's right in the center of the development um greg and i had that approved for removal but it took a year but we didn't we didn't pay anything for the land during that during the time of getting the approvals uh so there was ten thousand or maybe fifteen thousand of earnest money held with my attorney uh but it didn't go hard until we had the approvals to remove that cabin um but i did pay for all the work products so if if we didn't move forward with the deal, the seller would receive all the money that I paid towards um, civil engineering, but uh, we kept the property and we're moving forward with the construction, but uh, almost a decade to get a historic cabin removed. So uh, could take time. Uh, here's a question here. Um, Arish asked a question uh, about how do you get the money? So, you know, if I'm doing a 10 to $15 million project, 10 to $15 million project, uh, and I'm very confident with cash flow. How do I get the 20 to 25 percent down that the bank wants without using my own money? Um, can I use hard money? So no, you cannot use. Well, I don't say you can't use it. Hard money lenders typically don't lend. Um, you know, the down payment. Hard money is a little different thing. Typically, you're going to want to raise money with uh, you know investors. So you'll have equity investors that will uh, put up not only the down payment but cover your fee as a developer. So you're going to put a developer's fee on the project. Uh, cover all your hard and soft costs, you know, all your out-of-pocket expenses and things like that. So you can bring on partner or partners that will invest that 20 to 25% down, which is your equity uh, in the deal. And the lender is going to want to know where that's coming from, either you or your partners. They're, they're just going to want to know. But, you know, you can raise that through private lenders. You can raise it through, um, you know, just people that want to partner with you on the deal. Number of ways to do it. Um, you know, you can get the landowner to kick the land in and become, you know, equity in the deal. Uh, you know, the bank's still going to want something, even if the land, you know, satisfies that 20, 25%. They'd like to see, you know, some lenders like to see skin in the game. Uh, so that's how you do that. We've got a lot of good questions coming in. Um, yeah, somebody said they saw 20 acres listed for over a year. Seems like prime stuff. Weird, there's still something off. Yeah, you just never know what the story is with, with stuff like that. Lending's getting harder if we pull our money. Can't we get some, some phenomenal deals right now? Yeah, so there's gonna be a lot of deals. So here's the thing, there's several trillion dollars worth of commercial debt that's coming due in the next two years. So a lot of deals were originated over the last three to four years at record high prices with record low interest rates on short-term interest-only loans, like three to five year interest-only loans, some of them with floating rate debt. So the lenders are triggering uh, the due on sale clause for a lot of these loans because now they're upside down with their DC, DSCR ratios. So they're calling capital from the investors. If the investors aren't willing to put more capital in, then you know the bank's going to want that asset back or they're going to want that investor to sell it. So there's going to be a lot of assets coming, uh, coming up for sale here that uh, are going to represent some pretty good deals in the commercial and multifamily sector, especially in office and especially in multifamily. A lot of these multifamily deals that were done over the last couple of years they paid too much money and they put that short-term interest only debt on them. And now their, their debt's doubled 
and they're uh, they're way upside down. So what happens is the lender takes that asset back, and uh, if the if the you know uh, sponsor can't sell the asset, the lender will take it back. They'll sell the asset, wipes out all the equity investors, and then depending on you know the bad boy carve out, if it's a recourse or non recourse loan, if it's if it's recourse, they come after you potentially for the you know difference. If it's non-recourse, then they'll look to see if any kind of bad boy carve outs are triggered. And uh, you know, they'll they may pursue the sponsor in that case. So you always want to get non-recourse and you always want to understand what the covenants are and what those bad boy carve outs are. Back in 19 or 2009, I had two friends that were two of the biggest developers in the Hampton Roads area. They were each billionaires. And they got wiped out completely because they guaranteed the debt and they put in their own equity. So never put in your own equity and guarantee the debt uh, if you've got short-term interest. If you're doing long-term stuff, you know, that's fine. But uh, they got wiped out. Thoughts on state housing authority developments or government housing? Um, since I'm close to DC, government subsidized rent like Section 8 seems to be pretty market resilient. Yeah. Section 8 can be good, but it's very different. And there's a lot of restrictions on like how much you can charge, how much you can increase rents every year, you know, things like that. But they can be very good. And it's not just in inner city areas. You know, a lot of that Section 8 is retirees as well, like Florida. There's a lot of Section 8 properties that, you know, are, um, you know, limited income uh, occupants. So that, you know, there's a lot of opportunities there, but it's, you know, you just need to understand the rules. And there can be a lot of incentives on those types of properties as well. So those can be good. So what's the minimum amount of money that is needed to start in real estate development? So real estate development, like we said, requires deep pockets. It doesn't have to be yours, but it, somebody's got to have deep pockets on that team uh, and the bank's going to require that. So, um, you know, it's really all relative. If you want to start a company, then, you know, you've got your basic things that you have to do in terms of setting up a corporation, you know, get your website up, you know, things like that. You know, the money required to do a project, you don't need any of your own money, you know, but you need the money. Uh, to get it done. So just to give you an idea, just the entitlement process alone can be, you know, 100 to 300, you know, like Simon's project, you probably spent what about 300,000 on the entitlement process. Um, the civil engineer was 68 ish and the architects uh, were about 120. So right, right, right there, 200,000. Yeah. Plus, you know, plus or minus so the one that we're doing, the multifamily is going to be, yeah, I guess it'll be about 250 to three. And then you get into bigger developments and you can spend millions of dollars. So, you know, that that's all relative. So you got to spend that up front. The bank's not going to loan you that. So, you know, you've got to you've got to come up with the money somehow to get all the entitlements and the permits done, uh, you know, and paid for before you ever start and break ground. All right, cool. I got through all the questions in the chat, it looks like. So anybody have uh, anything else? Feel free to jump in. Josh, you're back in the basement. Um, yeah, per the usual. Uh, the uh, the wife's got all the cousins over too, so I'm kind of hiding. There's like 12 rugrats running out around the house. Uh, I was going to say, I thought maybe it was actually a real thing where you stay down there all the time because it's always one o'clock on Wednesdays, but now it's we're, we're not at one o'clock. It's not Wednesday. This is where I live under the stairs like Harry Potter. Uh, <laughs> I would just like to you know um, to emphasize what, what you guys said there. You know, uh, I think was it Paul asked a really good question. Like you drive by a piece of land, right? And then where, where do you go from there? I mean, what Greg and Simon said and, and Peter is like like you try to envision what could be there, and then you look at the zoning. And uh, if, if 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 it matches your your vision, you know, you could be good to go. And so that that's what I typically do to, to start with. And then if it if the land and the zoning match, then I go to my engineering group. I just um, looked at a piece of land this week. Uh, it seemed like some nice apartment land. And I called my engineer. He's like, yeah, it's zoned for apartments, but it's in a flood zone. So you're probably looking at like two years. Uh, they're trying to remove the flood zone, but it's still like two years out. So just know you're not doing anything with that property for two years, right? Like those little pieces of information uh, you, you find out hopefully quick, and then you can make better decisions. So anything we can do to be helpful, this is a lot of fun. 
uh, real estate developing. I love it. I love building stuff. Uh, I just love creating things, right? So um, um, I think, uh, who was it uh, that asked about Brandon, maybe asked about why not do like value add? Yeah, value add's great. And that's probably the most popular thing you, you see folks doing is value add multifamily. Um, but you also got to find out what excites you and what you're passionate about. And, and if it's building things and creating, you know, developments, you know, could be a good fit for you. Um, so anyways, thanks. Yeah, we got thanks a couple of everybody. good questions coming in, but on that flood zone thing, so that can be a really good place. So you can get, you know, FEMA map amendments that you can apply for. So a lot of times that can create an opportunity. So if it's a property or a building that's in a flood zone and uh, you want to develop it, you know, generally you can get a discount because it's in a flood zone and then you take the risk uh, of, you know, paying for what you need to do to get that FEMA map amendment. And it takes a couple of years, but if you can get it, then, you know, that can be, that can be a really good play, um, you know, for something like that. Uh, this is awesome, Greg. So, so the rules of the game are pretty much the same everywhere, the same model. So what Greg's saying is, you know, th this was a home flip or a wholesaler um, um, is the one that was trying to sell this to me. And they didn't have a clue that it was in a flood zone, right? So now that they know, uh, once they get confirmation on that, now I can say, okay, instead of paying you 350 grand, like you were hoping, I'll just pay you what you paid on it, whatever, 170 grand. And then I need to just hold those carrying costs, right? For, for the next couple of years, just buy it with cash and hold it. So um, great, great point, Greg. <laughs> yeah, one of the best skill sets you can develop as a developer is understanding the code and understanding what you can and can't do and really digging into it when it comes to wetlands, flood zones, things like that. I mean, you can lift buildings up, you can, you know, adjust, you know, levels, you can appeal stuff. There's all kinds of things that you can do. So you really, really want to get, you know, intimately familiar with the codes and the markets and the areas with the types of things that you're doing. And that's where your real opportunities are created. Uh, you know, like one of my, you know, gifts in development is maximizing property. I've, I've been able to do things with property, get more density, more lots, more square footage, more units than most other people, because I take the time to dig into the code and question things. So always be curious, always question. If somebody says, well, all you can do is this. Well, how do we know that? Why, why is that, you know, if, you know, if this driveway has to go this way, why is that the only way that has to go? So, you know, I always try to get, and that's where engineers can be really good too. They're creative. They can be quirky because they're creatives, but, you know, you always want to kind of make sure that, you know, you're questioning all the assumptions uh, in terms of the requirements and, and what people are telling you. Ask to see the code. You know, if somebody says, well, all you can do is this. Well, can you reference the code so I can read that? I'd love to learn and go through that and look at it. I, I think that was a great point. Land. Oh. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say that was a great point in regards to uh, looking at the land and why does the road need to be a certain way. Uh, the first project Greg and I worked on together, um, the the previous, the seller already started working with a civil engineer and there was a road going through a ledge and just one conversation, uh, Greg took a look at what was available uh, before a phone call. He looked at Google Earth and saw there was some landlocked land to the right of my pro uh, project. And first comment Greg made is, uh, I know this is designed, this is what somebody else paid for, but let's move this road, get it away from the ledge, um, buy that lot next door. And sure enough, just following those few little steps, um, Greg's advice, it was a three over $3 million savings in the land cost, I'm, I'm sorry, in site costs uh, for our construction, and it got us 10 more units on the property. So you really have to go in with an open mind. Don't just think because somebody said it's going to be 20 units, it can only be 20 units, or that a road needs to go a specific way, that that's the only way that it can go. Uh, the property now looks a heck of a lot better than the original design. We saved a tremendous amount, um, and we got more units. So tremendous value out there yeah yeah the i guess it was a retaining wall that you would have had to build and yeah. you know yeah it would have been about three million bucks so saved you three million made you three million plus the extra unit so those are the types of things that you always want to think about you know why do i have to do this you know what are my limitations and you know think outside those limitations so here's one thoughts on buying land in an upcoming area three acres and holding 10 to 15 years yeah absolutely i mean land banking is a great play um, some of the most successful, you know, people that I know in, in the game have done exactly that. You know, they go in the path of growth and just buy land up. One of the biggest landowners in my area um, started out that way. Uh, he just bought a piece of land here and 
he's one of the largest landowners in the area. And I was just asking, well, how'd you get all this stuff over 40 years? He said, well, I didn't have any system. He said, I bought this land here. And he said, well, I figured if I bought that, I might as well buy this. And he said, then people, the word got out. And if people needed money, they would come to him and they would start selling him land. Say, hey, I heard you bought Mr. Jones land over here. Mr. You know, I'm Mr. Smith. I live next door. You want to buy mine? So he just accumulated, you know, over 40 years, hundreds and hundreds of acres. He's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And, um, you know, he did develop some things, a hotel and a Walmart and did some buildings for the government along the way as well. But, um, you know, his main thing was land banking. I got another guy that uh, was down in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. He bought land back there 50 years ago when he was when you just bought oceanfront property by the mile. And he bought, you know, 30 miles worth of oceanfront property and just developed it out over the years and made hundreds of millions of dollars doing it. And that's all he did. You know, he didn't do anything else. He just did land and sold lots. You know, he didn't even build anything. Um, so that could be an excellent play uh, in the right areas. So don't go buy farmland in the middle of nowhere unless you can lease it, <laughs> you know, but you want to make sure it's it's in the right areas. So I have, I uh, only have experience active real estate investing. How would you recommend someone like me get started in development? So, you know, education first, you got to educate yourself and then start with what's accessible to you. Easiest thing to start with is a, is a spec house or a rental house, you know, build to rent. You can do a duplex, a quad five unit, multifamily gets a little bit more complicated, but it depends on what your resources are financially. Um, you know, you can fill the education gap in with your team. Um, so I would start with what you can based on your financial ability to do a deal. So a spec house is very easy to start with. You can sell it, you can rent it, a lot of multiple exits, you know, above that medical and dental, you're in the business, you understand it. Um, you can build your own practice, build one for somebody else, put another operator in there, build a strip center like Josh. Uh, I believe that was your first development, right? Was a multidiscipline strip center? That was my first ground up. Yep. Yeah. I knew dental. And so I, I very much understood what it was like to be a tenant in a retail building and what I wanted. And so um, working with my local team, it, was, it wasn't it was a huge jump to do a ground up because I had a great team and, and I understood um, being a tenant in a space like that. Yeah. Flood zones take longer inherently or red tape? Yeah. So flood zones you know, are just um, a limitation on the elevation of your building. So you can build in a flood zone, but the building has to be elevated and your insurance is going to be higher. So what I'm talking about is a map amendment with FEMA. And that takes a long time because yes, red tape. So that's basically what that boils down to. A lot of red tape, just like dealing with wetlands and the Army Corps of Engineers. But as far as building in a flood zone, you can build in a flood zone, but you have to have the first, you know, floor of heated space has to be above the base flood level. So it's not that you can't do it. There's just rules, you know, about it. And if you're near water, you know, bodies of water, creeks, rivers, bays, estuaries, oceans, you know, there's setbacks and, you know, limitations. But flood zone is just, you know, water levels and you just have to be above it, you know. So that that's the biggest restriction there and that's easily solved. Um, hesitant about developing duplexes in Southern California, crazy hard to find land. Um or to find a developer to answer calls. Okay, so I guess a builder or whatever, not sure how committed they'd be for the project. Yeah, you know, you just got to keep going and find the right ones. Everybody's busy right now. A lot of people are backlogged. Um, you know, when you say a developer, I don't know if you're talking about a builder, you know, finding a builder that was uh, Mustafa. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, builders are, are backed up right now, but there's other developers too that you could potentially partner with, you know, not just builders, but, you know, yeah, it's it's tough right now everywhere. Builders are backed up in, in a lot of areas. Uh, but the ways you find them is you, you know, talk to realtors, you drive around, see who's building stuff, um, you know, talk to other developers, home builders association. Uh, you know, that's that's where you find your builders. Okay. So for people that are looking to get into real estate as an investment, but but not maybe looking to get to go the route of Simon or me or Josh um, starting a construction or development company, what are the opportunities in the space for those looking to take a more passive role? So you can invest with you know Simon and Josh. You know they they have opportunities. Probably some other people on here, Peter. Um, so they have passive opportunities for you to invest with them. Um, something else too, if you haven't uh, learned about it yet. So, uh, you know, from a tax standpoint, you want to get that real estate professional status if you can. If you can't, there's a short-term rental exclusion. So what the real estate professional status is all about 
It's um, it's giving you the ability to offset your income with passive losses. Okay, um, short-term rentals are not considered passive, so there's an exclusion. So you don't have to qualify as a real estate professional to get a passive law or to get that loss from a short-term rental property. So you can own a short-term rental property and just manage the bookings and do accelerated depreciation and cost segregation study on that and offset your W-2 income. So, you know, keep that in the back of your mind and go research that, you know, uh, short-term rental exclusion. Uh, that's a great way to help offset your uh, W-2 income if you're not a real estate professional. And, uh, you know, other than that, if you invest in a deal passively, you can share in the depreciation, but all, all that's going to offset is the profit in that deal unless you're a real estate professional. You can't use it to offset your income. It's only going to offset, you know, passive income that comes from that deal. All right. Awesome, Greg. We are coming up uh, we're past the hour. So thank you for that. Sure. Um, just, to, so much. just to plug uh, a couple things. Again, the, the Dental Developer Facebook group. I, I feel like everyone brought some great energy to this. We're really trying to build this denter, uh, dental developer group into something big. So if you could bring that uh, energy uh, and engagement to that as well. Um, follow us on Facebook, Balin Development. Um, and also, of course, Greg, the Greg Dickerson Show on YouTube. Just Google it. It will come up. Um, and Greg, can you uh, plug your, your website as well? I think it's Dickerson International. GregDickerson.com. That's the easiest way. Yep. GregDickerson.com. And, um, you know, on that note, so development, my throat gets dry when I talk a lot. So the development, so um, development can be ground up. Development can be opportunistic where you take an existing building and it could be a warehouse, could be a school, could be an office building and you turn it into something else, mixed use, you know, commercial multiband, whatever. Uh, you know, you could have a you know, uh, one building and you add on to it, it can be a heavy lift value add. So even value add is a form of development renovations. So development's not necessarily always ground up. There's a lot of different ways to do development. Sometimes, you know, taking existing buildings in those urban cores and, you know, gentrifying those or doing adaptive reuse or, you know, mixed use are, are great ways to do development as well. So, you know, in terms of growing the group from real estate development standpoint, it doesn't always mean ground up. It doesn't always mean buildings. You can do land as well. You can make a ton of money just, you know, finding pieces of land, getting them entitled, just do the paper entitlements and then flip that land to a builder or developer and make really good profits doing that kind of stuff. You can just do the, um, you know, you can do the horizontal development and get them pad ready and flip pads. So there's a lot of different ways you can take advantage of opportunities in the development space. So it's, it's not always just ground up. And then one more question. Here's a good one. Would you say it's worth syndicate, uh, syndicating and partnering for larger developments to keep uh, yourself with smaller developments, but you own 100%. So um, when I started out, I did everything on my own and that worked very well for me. My goal was to compound cash and I was a merchant developer. I build and sell, you know, I built to sell. So for me, that was my strategy. Uh, when you do syndicated deals, uh, a lot of times you have to have a lot of pieces and a lot of partners in there. And by the time you divide it up, it may or may not make any sense. So you just gotta do the math. So if you have an opportunity that you can do yourself, you know, look at that. What is your return versus what's the velocity if you do one with a group of people that's really big? So for you as a sponsor, you know, you have to make that decision yourself and, uh, you know, on those larger deals because, you know, you're going to have to give up some equity to your partners and things like that, but you're going to get developer fees. So, you know, in a $50 million development deal, you're going to have a, you know, 3% developer fee. So you're going to have a $1.5 million, you know, developer fee along the way, which is your compensation. Uh, as well as equity in the deal. So you just have to run those numbers yourself. But um, all right, well, I'll leave that there. It's nine o'clock and uh, let you guys, you know, do your thing. Hey, Greg, one, Greg. More, one more thing. Um, can you just leave us maybe on talking about the webinar that, I, and I'm going to put it into chat that you and Simon are doing and investing in uh, turbulent times. Uh, maybe just yeah. take hit on that. And then, you know, this was, I think a great first, pints and properties and you know we'll be doing this every month we won't be lucky to have greg on <laughs> on everyone uh, he's a very busy guy but uh, we, we do thank you so much for this and maybe just talk a little bit about what we're going to do on the webinar um and take us out yeah yeah i wanted to be on this first one help you guys get kicked off and you know thank you guys for being here and listening to me go on but uh, yeah so the other one's going to be very specific to investing in turbulent times 
and you know what you need to do to protect yourself, uh, not only in the business, but all the way around from an economic standpoint. I study the economy and you know, I advise a lot of people on their investments, not just real estate. How do you protect yourself and your estate? How do you make a bunch of money, keep it and grow it so that you can sustain for generations? Uh, but this is a very unique time. So I went through 2009. Like I said, I was I was in it hot and heavy in 2009. Um, you know, this is really my third cycle. I bought my first house in 1990 and that 90 to 95 was kind of weird. I went through the dot com, you know, bubble with everybody and uh, 2009. So uh, this is a very unique time. There's some very things unique things that, you know, can happen and uh, things that we need to, to do. So it's it's going to be all about, you know, how do you find the right projects? How do you protect yourself in those projects? And how do you, you know, sustain and grow your wealth for generations to come? So that's what we're going to talk about on that webinar. Excellent. Thank you again, Greg, so much uh, for joining us. Um, and as I mentioned, Greg uh, is my mentor and was my mentor. And uh, you can check his website. He does have courses on the website. And we do meet every Wednesday for a mastermind as well. And you can find out information about that as well. Uh, the mastermind has amazing people in there. Uh, I mean, Greg's there every, every Wednesday running it. Um, but we have a few physicians, uh, uh, quite a few dentists, some um, people that just, uh, Samantha just does, uh, she's a land broker. Um, Football players. I mean, just the, the groups. The, it's it's interesting group. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of assets under management. Um, beyond this, uh, Roshan and Nathan did kind of give us a little plug today. So we're. I think Greg, are you speaking at their event? They invite you, or? Yeah, they invited me to their live event, but you know okay. I can't make that. But I am going to do a training for their group as well. Okay. Um, so Josh and I are speaking at that event that's live in uh, September, I believe. So if you guys want to see us live, um, and then we are going to have an event on the East Coast as well. It's going to be a little bit more geared towards development. And uh, we'd like to be able to do that to where we could actually view some of the developments currently under construction. So we'll try to do that probably around the October timeframe. And uh, we're trying to get some room at, at Harvard. So we'll probably ask Pete to set up a room for us if you, if you can. <laughs> any uh anything else you want to add pete hopefully they'll let me into harvard yeah oh just kidding no uh th thank you thank you all uh this was great and be on be on the lookout for for the next one um and we'll we'll see you in the dental developer facebook group yep, y'all have a great thank evening everyone. thanks for having me all right thank you so much greg